thank you sir now we move to now we move to the keynote speech and the keynote speech will be delivered by professor ramesh jimbo bunaratna well the very person who actually studied in india the person who studied in india ramesh jimbo bunaratna sir obtained his bachelor's and master degree in anthropology from punjab university and a phd from mahidol university he worked as a research geologist with the wildlife conservation society for 10 years until 1996 He was a full-time consultant to biodiversity conservation and ecosystems protection projects throughout much of Asia for another ten years. He is currently an associate professor at the Mahidol University International College in Thailand. He also serves as the Asian Primates Journal's editor in chief and a regional vice chair of the IUCN. SSC Primate Projects Group. We are proud that the people like you, sir, they are joining us in this conference and are helping us, sir, as biodiversity conservation and ecosystem protection research areas. He has research areas in protected area planning and management, participatory conservation and natural resource and management. responsible tourism sustainable tourism eco tourism and community based tourism sir these words are somewhere people are at least some of them are un, even unknown words are there what is eco tourism such words are even unknown where we can apply and place like assam which is rich has a very rich say space for tourism that we hope that with your sir address so i now request honorable professor ramesh jimbo bumaratna sir to deliver the keynote address and who is at present delivering his address from mahidol university international college bank of thailand sir please namaskar respected participants good morning guwahati and good afternoon from thailand let me just share my slide if i can get it correct i think i should be okay so let me know if you can't see my slide it's visible sir ah okay wonderful all right now what if what if the massive asteroid that hit earth about 65 million years ago did not hit earth that's my question All right and it did not lead to the extinction of the dinosaurs and give rise to the age of mammals well unfortunately or fortunately depending on your perspective that did not happen our mammal ancestors had a fantastic time they evolved they diversified and they multiplied one species in particular multiplied at an alarming rate the population explosion of the species and the industrial revolution of the mid 18th century and from the 19th to the 20th century have resulted in severe environmental degradation and contributed directly to the climate emergency ultimately with disastrous impacts and consequences on the species well-being what a very strange species probably the only species that is driving itself to extinction now before i go on with my keynote i wish to express my sincere thanks to the hosts and organizers for inviting me in particular dr sada nanda nath and professor jogan chandra kalita now i shall attempt what was said earlier and what shall be talked over the next few days looking across the conference teams and sub teams i see several commonalities despite the commonalities 
experience informs me that there is a danger that both the participants and audience might, as we dive into the presentations, lose vision of the conference aims and objectives and their significance. Firstly, my keynote address aims to draw our attention to the common denominators of the conference and highlight the fact that we are all cogs in this great big wheel. This big wheel we call the environment. However, humans have been shaping the environment to meet our needs and unfortunately also our greed, resulting in several undesirable consequences. Consequences that affect the quality of the environment, the biodiversity, our economies, our livelihoods, our food security, essentially our well-being. Secondly, I want you to bear the overall picture of this conference at the back of your mind and not treat each conference sub-team and paper presentation in isolation. Thirdly, I want you to envision the linkages or potential linkages across the different disciplines and presentations. Fourthly, I want you to identify the individual and collective gaps in our knowledge and practices and formulate the needs and strategies to bridge those gaps. And finally, I hope you will start to identify individuals and agencies to network with and establish a multidisciplinary approach or further strengthen your efforts by applying a transdisciplinary approach to address the dire state of our environment. Excuse me. Now, as you can see from this slide, I have grouped the first set of words that jump out from this conference team and sub teams as assets. Why assets? A short definition of an asset is a property, a person or quality that is valuable or useful. Well, there is no doubt that the environment is a critical asset. So here, our environmental assets include naturally occurring living and non-living entities of our planet Earth. Together, they comprise the biophysical environment that delivers the ecosystem services and that directly and indirectly benefits us through their normal functions. A healthy environment maintains our well-being. It def therefore deserves every possible protection. But the environment cannot protect itself from its biggest threats, and that's we humans. As I mentioned earlier, humans are a strange lot. We tend to abuse and destroy the very thing that sustains us. But who or what is going to protect the environment from humans? There's no one else except we humans. Hence, humans are also an asset. We are crucial for protecting the environment from other humans and other threats such as natural disasters. In addition, we also need to manage this vital asset. But we will look at the protection and management a little later. The ecosystem services mentioned in the earlier slide are those quantifiable services that ecosystems provide to sustain and fulfill human life. Essentially, ecosystem services are the essence upon which civilization depends upon. History has already informed us that once you take that away, civilization collapses. These ecosystem services can be categorized to supporting, provisioning, regulating, and cultural. But I'm not going to talk about something that I believe all participants are already aware of. I'm highlighting it here as this aspect of, of the environment is something I believe that can be used both as a linkage and a leverage to convince the beneficiaries and gain support for your works. All right. Now let's look again at the conference teams and sub-teams. This is what the conference is all about, highlighting and dealing with the threats and impacts to our assets and dealing with the consequences of degraded or loss of our valuable assets. They are no longer to be treated as common words. To protect and manage our assets effectively and sustainably, we need to acknowledge, identify, and understand the type and nature of these threats. 
their impacts, consequences, and importantly, underlying drivers. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's look at this example for further clarification. Here I have two major threats, linear infrastructure and biological resource use. Examples of linear infrastructure include roads, railways, gas pipelines, and power cables. And examples of biological resource use include hunting, logging, harvesting of non-timber forest produce. The impacts these threats have on our assets can include biodiversity loss, habitat loss, habitat degradation, and fragmentation. These threats do not simply occur out of the blue. They can be driven by poverty, failing crops, food insecurity, market demands, poor policies, and weak legislation. Moreover, one threat can be the driver to several other threats. In addition, these threats and impacts can enter a feedback loop and exacerbate new and existing threats. At the meta scale, all threats and impacts to biodiversity, the natural resources, and whole ecosystems will bring about severe environmental degradation. Addressing environmental degradation is what this conference is all about. We have already started seeing the worsening consequences of environmental degradation over the past several decades. They include drought and floods, extreme weather events and climate instability, crops failure and food shortages, widespread diseases and failing health, rising cost of goods and supplies, loss of incomes and employment, financial crisis and global recession, just to name some. See, my slide is not behaving properly at the moment. Just give me a second. Ah, okay, fine. All right, let's move on. Okay, for the purpose of this conference, I will use tools in a broader sense to include techniques, mechanisms, steps, procedures, approaches, and strategies, among others. Among this broader umbrella of tools, we can have actions and activities that include management, indigenous knowledge bank, adaptation, mitigation, protection, laws and legislation, research and monitoring, local ecological knowledge, co-management, resource use management, rehabilitation, restoration, poverty alleviation, alternative livelihoods, policy and governance, education and awareness, avoidance, reduction, repair, offset, connectivity, protected areas, protected species, rules and regulation, and law enforcement, just to name the main ones. And these are the words I expect to see over the next couple of days. And I heard many of these words earlier this morning. Now, listing this, I'm listing this out because I expect to hear tangible lessons learned and best practices over the conference duration. And I'm hoping to see clear proposals of specific actions and activities that will guide relevant parties better, not just another recommendation that we need to save and protect the environment for our future generation. We are past that. We are at a critical juncture of human evolution. The decisions and actions that we take now will, de will determine the course that human evolution will take. Now, whilst on tools, I wish to highlight an important tool that has not received much attention, environmental resilience. Environmental resilience here refers to the capacity of an ecosystem to respond to a disturbance, firstly, by resisting damage, and secondly, by recovering quickly. Such disturbances can be both natural or anthropogenic in origins. As we all know, Severe disturbances can profoundly affect the ecosystem and ultimately the environment. Therefore, we ought to be looking beyond protecting 
sustain an intact ecosystem. Protection alone cannot guarantee the ecosystem's persistence. Hence, we ought to be proactively reinforcing these ecosystems to allow for resilience to be built up against unforeseen stochastic events, especially in the face of the ongoing climate emergency. Here is another tool to assist in determining which tool to employ under what circumstances. Hence, you might consider using this when dealing with development projects that may result in environmental degradation. There are four main categories in this mitigation hierarchy, and they include one, avoidance. This refers to consideration to options to avoid impacts on biodiversity, associated ecosystem services, and people, essentially the total environment. This is the best option, but it's not always possible. Where environmental and social factors give rise to unacceptable negative impacts, then the development project should not take place. Two, minimize. This refers to considering alternatives in the project location, siting, scale, layout, technology, and phasing, essentially to minimize impacts on biodiversity and ecosystem services. In cases where there are environmental and social constraints, then every effort should be made to minimize those impacts too. Three, rehabilitate or restore. This refers to the rehabilitation or restoration of areas where impacts are unavoidable. And measures are provided to return the impacted areas to the near natural state after the development project has been achieved. The fourth category, which we always leave for the last. This refers to measures over and above rehabilitation to compensate for the residual adverse effects of, on biodiversity and the associated ecosystem after every effort has been made to minimize and then rehabilitate the impacts. Offsets can provide a mechanism to compensate for significant residual impacts on biodiversity. If that was a bit too complex, here's a simplified version. Uh, and the decision-making pathways. Avoidance and minimization can be grouped into preventive, that is our primary goal, and restoration and offsets can be grouped into remediative, where our primary goal cannot be achieved to satisfaction. Now can we come to the next set of words, all right? Actors. Now, we know that we need to protect our assets from various threats, impacts, and the consequences. And we know the tools that we need to use to protect and manage our assets. Therefore, the next step is to identify the actors with whom we are to entrust the tasks and responsibilities. Traditionally, much of the protection, conservation, and management work falls within the relevant government agencies and educational institutions and NGOs roles typically are to backstop the government agencies with research, monitoring, and outreach work. However, of late, we see more overlap in their roles, tasks, and obligations. Sometimes this marriage is complementary. At other times, there are conflicts and duplication of efforts. Now, let's have a look at some of these actors and their potential actions. The expected or possible actions from the different actors can be broadly divided into two groups, those that implement and those that are supportive. While the goals are common to all actors, their motivations may be different. For some, it is an obligatory duty. For others, a commitment or a necessity or a moral or spiritual obligation and a civic sense. Development banks, for example, have an obligation to ensure that they have stringent environmental safeguards to tie to their financial mechanism or financing mechanism and the mechanisms to ensure borrowers' compliance with the safeguards. What about businesses and corporations? Well, some are fulfilling their corporate, social, and environmental responsibility. Others may be simply greenwashing, but if they realize that their impacts on the environment and the benefits and services they obtain from healthy ecosystems, then 
they are likely to take a proactive role towards achieving the common goals. Well, maybe not all, but I believe many would. I'll talk more about this in a little while. So what about you and I? Some of us are actors, while others are the matchmakers, showing the linkages between livelihoods and food security to the environmental well-being, for example, or guiding different parties to work together, or showing where the efforts can be complementary. All right, excuse me. Now, uh, let's go back and take a closer look at businesses, corporations, and sadly, most governments. Because development is typically measured in terms of economic development, therefore, we operate as if the economy is the foundation of everything else. So with this mindset, you can see how shaky our practices are. Because everything, the economy, we humans, our joys, our happiness, all depend on a healthy environment. Remove the environment from the equation, there's nothing left. Unfortunately, this is our ongoing mindset and the practices. All right, so hence, if we want to achieve a prosperous and sustainable economy, then this ought to be the desired mindset and practice. We can see that the economy is only a tiny fraction of the overall picture. The economy depends on human capital, and both economy and human well-being are dependent on a healthy, thriving environment. And finally, we come to a critical, but often an ignored aspect of protection, conservation, management, and so on. That is the gaps. We may come up with the best tools, best actors, but if gaps persist, even the best implementation and efforts will not allow us to achieve the intended goals to satisfaction. Essentially, gaps are the thorns that will cause our well-planned actions to become less effective and even vulnerable. Hence, when we talk about gaps, we are actually talking about the issues and constraints that will act as barriers or obstacles to a successful implementation of our tools. Similarly to threats and impacts, we will need to predict if during the planning stage and identify the issues and constraints, if the action is in place, then we need to formulate a strategy that addresses the identified issues and concerns and consider existing constraints or limitations here I have listed some examples of issues and constraints that are common to environmental protection, biodiversity conservation, and ecosystem protection. They include issues and constraints that relate to regulatory and governance, such as weak or no management, or weak or no conservation tools, legally binding instruments, compliance, coordination and cooperation, implementation and enforcement, penalties and punishments. In some cases, we still lack the baseline data. In most, however, we still have poor knowledge of our rich biodiversity, detailed knowledge of the functions and services of the various ecosystems, detailed understanding of the direct threats, underlying drivers and stresses, and type, nature, and severity of those threats. Right? Not only that, the underlying drivers and stress, I, ha I, had, I need to emphasize this. Also, those that deal with the capacity and nature of the human actors, such as their competence level, the level of education and awareness, their interest to participate, identifying and prioritizing needs, and greed and corruption, probably the biggest challenges to effective protection and conservation. By now, I hope my keynote address and my expectations of the conference outcomes have become clearer to all participants. Here, I illustrate one aspect of the underlying linkages of the conference team and sub-teams. To reiterate, we started talking about our assets, then we talk about the threats and impacts to these assets and the importance of correctly identifying these threats. Similarly, the understanding of the significance of the associated impacts and correctly identifying the threats and consequences of an earlier set of threats. 
We also saw that correctly identifying the threats will in turn assist us in identifying the correct conservation responses and in prioritizing the threats, the impacts and the responses. Then we acknowledge that we have, we are to achieve, if we are to achieve sustainable protection and conservation, we also need to identify and understand the underlying drivers to these threats. Only then can we hope to develop the appropriate conservation actions to mitigate the underlying drivers, threats, and stresses. To wind up this keynote, I salute all of you, the participants of this conference, and those out there working against all odds to save our environment. And here I have listed out some keywords that I'm expecting to see during the conference or as outcomes of the conference, keywords that reflect the state of our environment and the tools and approaches to employ to better assist our efforts. To sum up, I'd like to emphasize on the biodiversity contribution to our well being, both directly and indirectly. Biodiversity essentially is the building block of life. Biodiversity ensures that the ecosystems function normally. These normal functions in turn allow the ecosystem to provide the services that all of us are benefiting from. Moreover, healthy and intact ecosystems also ensure there is environmental resilience, especially in the face of climate crisis. With that, I'd like to wish the organizers and hosts a hearty Donobad. Also, I like to wish all participants a successful conference, a successful deliberation of their findings and ideas, and fruitful post-conference networking and collaboration that will positively impact our collective efforts to mitigate the ongoing environmental crisis. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Oh, you lovely presentation. Wonderful. And, uh, <laughs> In this a very common way, if I would like to put it in the other way, sir. What I would say, sir, that if the, you may buy a very costly seed and if the field is not proper, it is not properly prepared, I think that seed will go in vain. So as sir, you have shown beautifully that economic, our economic condition, that everything lies on the environment first. So we must protect the environment first and accordingly we are to say, proceed and your title of the keynote address as ecosystems and human well-being linkages and gaps beautifully highlighted sir and here you have shown one very important aspect that greed and corruption it plays a major role sir in a country like i'll not say i'll not name any country but the thing is that in some countries it's like that sir it's difficult to manage things sir so you have given a very brief presentation <coughs> and, of course, having a vast meaning, you know, presentation, sir. And uh, what I'll say that whenever you have any visit to India, please make in your itinerary that Aviapuri College you have to visit, sir. Yeah. Here's my request. And I, on behalf of college, request you that where you might be coming and meeting Jogan Pelta, sir. It's very easy for you. But we'd <laughs> like to meet you, sir. And whenever you come, please, sir, visit our college. Keep it in your itinerary, sir. Thank you very yeah. much, sir, for your Doctor, Doctor Rajesh, Doctor Rajesh Tiwari. Actually, sir, sir. Professor Ramesh Jimbo Bunaratana was the person who constructed sir. the main, particularly the main topic of the international seminar. I yes, sent him three, four when I got from you, yes, three, sir. four options you gave me. Then I sent to him and he worked overnight on your proposals. And finally, next day morning, he gave me the, your beautiful title for, of the international seminar. And therefore, I once again give a very big clap for him. Yes, sir. How do you, sir? We are, at least through Jogan Kelta, sir, sir, we got the title. But Jogan Kelta, sir, worked with you. It yeah. was not known to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. And please make it that when you visit, Please make it yeah. that you come to our college and we'll be delighted to receive you, sir. And Jagan Gelda, sir, we are always respect, respecting him and inviting him whenever we get a chance. Sometimes he is unable to come due to his busy schedule, but 
sir whenever it because you people can meet but we are unable yeah. to meet you so sir please <laughs> make it a part sir Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much. Thank you very much, and Professor Hilopati Sinha is also from Borland University, head of the Department of Zoology. So we all will work together to bring Professor Ramesh Bunaratna to Assam. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Sure, sure, sir. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. And now it's uh, the session is open for uh, interactions. If uh, participants they would like to ask any kind of questions to Bunaratna sir, sir is here. And we'll be pleased to answer your questions. So may I request the participants to ask questions if they have got any, so that we can interact. Pori Devi, ask them to write on the chat box even. Chat box, they can put their questions. Yeah, or they can ask directly. So it's a very important okay deliberation. I am sure I shall uh, attempt to respond to the questions, yeah. although I cannot guarantee I know everything. <laughs> I lost my crystal ball. Sir, sir I, I'd like to ask, sir, put my question, sir. Yes, please. Brother, sir, I'd like to put my question, sir. Sir, is there any alternative, sir, so that we can uh, completely demolish or remove the use of plastic, sir? Is there any alternative? Yes and no. Yes, depending on what kind. I will say yes and no, depending on what kind of plastic. I mean, it's uh, it's ridiculous when we see all this campaign that says stop the plastic, stop the... It will not go away. Plastic is still a very useful tool, right? We need plastic. But here we got to come up with two things. What kind of plastic can we allow? That means we're, we're talking about stopping single-use plastic. Now, uh, I was working in Bangladesh a couple of times. And I was impressed they use jute for their shopping bag. Isn't that great? And jute biodegrade. So we're talking about natural uh, item in, in the, that's available in abundance in Bangladesh. So maybe Assam could be looking at something like that. Look in your environment. And of course, uh, assist those industries, the small and medium enterprises that are producing single-use plastic to help them to re reach another level because they can't go on their own but they need some kind of maybe financial assistance technical assistance whereby they can shift from sing producing single-use plastic to something more user-friendly uh, then we also have the component of laws and legislation banning altogether but uh, banning altogether does not work so we, we're talking about banning providing an alternative assistance to the industries that depend on say producing single-use plastic and then at the same time, promote those uh, items that we have maybe have been using in the past or with a bit, little bit of innovation, improve those items that we use in the past to help in packaging. We're talking about uh, reusable items, right? So, it, and it be, can be made, the value can be added. Here I'm putting in business factor. The value can be added by putting the Assamese culture into those products. So people become proud of using, say, the tiffin carrier, that Assamese-style tiffin carrier. And visitors might want to buy those products. And then maybe you determine, okay, it should not be uh, industrial level, but it should be at the cottage level, so that we're talking about assisting the communities in coming up with those products. So, I mean, those are the, some of the things that are off the top of my head. This can be a, a whole new workshop that you're asking, which would be fun to engage in, right? So yes, uh, it'll be yes and no. It depends on the nature of the plastic, the lo laws and legislation. At the same time, assisting education and make people proud. Because one thing, one of one of the biggest obstacle to implementing anything is people's own attitude. Right? Uh, a lot of times, we can be influenced by extrinsic values, in extrinsic factors, but. I find intrinsic factors very powerful. I want to do it because I want to do it. Rather, rather than I want to do it because others ask me to do it. And of course, then we talk about management. We haven't, just now we talk about uh, economy, assisting the industries. What about management? We're talking about waste management. So that's also very important. So much of the problem lies when people say, okay, we stop single-use plastic. Well. I sort out my waste. 
actually I have maybe one waste, small waste in two weeks. But the rubbish collectors collect them and dump everything in the same place, even if you sort them out. So it has to be from, you have to look at the chain of custody. And this is something maybe the deputy commissioner might want to take up, looking at the chain of custody of waste, ma waste management. Look at the situation right now, study it, get the whole team, get everyone who wants to be involved, right? We're talking about no money involved in using the brain. There are many brains in Assam. People with different ideas. Get them together, have some chai, and then you can come up with wondrous ideas. Okay, this is where we have the gaps. This is where we have the linkages. How do we overcome that? And what are the issues and constraints if we put in the solution? So you're, you're using a precautionary approach, right? For the students out there, uh, you might want to Google up precautionary principles. And this is what we use in terms of running uh, massive projects and whatnot. Or in put it in simpler words, think of Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. So by using precautionary principles, we are prepared. So I think a two or three day workshop or think tank over chai will be fantastic. You can come up with the problem solving. I mean, you can't change the whole of India, but maybe at the Assam state, and instead of coming up with the whole of Assam, I would recommend looking for demonstration site. So maybe a district or a sub-district. So you, you look, and then uh, you could be looking at different demonstration sites, a, a, a village, a small village, a bigger village, a small town. So if through after, say, six months or one year of monitoring and evaluation, you can see uh, where are the pitfalls, where are the gaps, where are the linkages, where are the opportunities, and then you improve it, improve on it. Once that those things are improved, then you can replicate to the other towns and cities or at the state level. Don't be afraid to dream. That's how, That's what I always say. Thank you, sir. Anything else? Oh, I, I can go on on that, by the way. Yes, and one that, the point that you have mentioned, sir, is very clear that though we are managing it separately, but ultimately it's dumped together. It's a very important point that you have mentioned, sir. And... Uh, my request, all of the other participants, if they have got any kind of queries, they can ask, sir, because it's a golden opportunity for them. Rajesh, have a <coughs> Rajesh I, I have one question I put in the start box. Okay, in sir. the start box, I put the question. question was that, can Obhayapuri College Bongaigao make a vision document for the entire state of Assam for getting rid of many environmental crises with the help of the most dynamic Deputy Commissioner, and under the guidance of Professor Ramesh Jimbo Bunaratana. Because that will be a big document if this college can take the lead. Sure, sir. Professor, your comment? <laughs> sure, sir. Yeah. We'll try our best, sir. <clears throat> and said, uh, some of the unique ideas that you have given us, hmm. we never thought about it. And since uh, you are there, so we are connected with Bumaratana, sir. Yeah. Because we'll be able to catch him. Yeah. And so through that, we can prepare the document, sir. And uh, as uh, the person uh, I'm just looking at, sir, I don't know, a kind of a query is coming in me that I want to see you, sir. Please. So in that way, I think you'll be helping us a lot. And we'll be able to uh, prepare the document as sir has suggested. And sir, definitely, sir, we'll think about it and we'll have a committee on it so that this can be prepared in con consultation with you and Bhubarata, sir. Thank you, sir. It's yeah. a very beautiful suggestion, sir. Can Thank I you, chip sir, in? Professor, sir, for your good suggestion. Can I chip in? All right. Uh, you don't have to start from scratch. There are already many lessons, learns, and uh, best practices all across the globe. Only need a bit of uh, research. And talking about research, the actions and activities that goes into your strategic planning can be a product for the master's or PhD student also. Yeah. Right? If you have a clear uh, research requirements, then it could be a group effort, say, for a, one course, even for the undergrads, for the master's, and then those who want to do master's thesis or PhD thesis, those, those are bigger topics. Right? So, and the document that you prepare because since I'm involved with a, lot, a number of uh, best practices uh, and action plans at the ICN level, you have to make it as simple as possible. 
no complication. So, so basically, it should not be a thick, voluminous document because nobody reads that. Only academicians might understand it. So, we what we need is what, who, why, budget, activities, places, timeline, just something clear so that when someone picks it up, okay, this is what I need to do when. Okay, this is me. I'm an I'm a academician, or oh, this is me. I'm the district officer, or oh, this is me. I am in charge of the collecting the waste in the municipality. I just go direct to that page and know what I have to do. So this is something that we might want to think of. But of course, that that is going at the town level. But think start from the college level. So you have your college. Identify the surrounding of your college. Who are the stakeholders of your college? Right. You have the students. You have the parents, uh, students, parents. You have the com nearby communities. So look at them at a as a stakeholder and see them as beneficiaries. And we're talking about equitable partnership. It's a slow process. It needs some guidance. But once it gets off, fantastic. You'll get it done. Sorry, Thank you, I'm sir. Too long. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And a point that sir, you have mentioned, which is very, very important, that is a big document is only read by the academicians. <laughs> We try to prepare a lot of things, sir. but actually those, those things, ultimately people look at the main points. What are the main right. points? So at least this is the direction that you are giving us. And uh, in this slide, sir, definitely we'll move. And as uh, now, Jagan Kalta, sir, has invited and the responsibility. And then we'll be calling him again so that he will help us in this matter. I think that somebody was asking that, is there any project in this regard? Some question was there most in the chat box. Yeah, here is a question in the chat box that is there any project ongoing in which developing countries are assessing ecosystem health by using frameworks like Millennium Ecosystem Assessment? That is a I question by Gola. Right, I can't think of any specific country, but I do know that there are a number of agencies doing that. Right, whether they do it at the country level or at the specific site and uh, and you've already mentioned the, the the assessment at the assessment itself they have the documents that you can have a look and are ongoing so it could be part of the assessment of the mea uh, framework or it could be coming now we're talking about sdgs so they're using the sdg framework so people are using components of it or or whole part of it so uh, there are already out documents out there so basically just look at the mea website and also the iucn website iucn website you can have a number of commissions so look at the commission that deal with such aspect and also the unsdg all right and uh, for instead of starting from scratch as i mentioned uh also pick up going back to the earlier talk go uh, pick up some best practices and action plans so they are they call guidelines best practices and action plans so these are three three overlapping documents so just look at this so you can get uh you know hey this is how we are this is a template for what we're going to do at the college level and then over time you can start thinking about coming up hey let's do it for the district i see another question in the chat box can i get your presentation yes i will convert it to pdf and send it to professor jogan and uh, maybe you'll get in touch with Professor Jogan as a contact point. Does that help? Okay, sir. That will help, sir. <laughs> All right. Anything else? <laughs> anything I can be of assistance? Sir, sir. Hello? Yes, I'm listening. Sir, uh, namaskar, sir. No namaskar. Sir, namaskar, namaskar, sir. Uh, it's not a question. Uh, I want solution from you, actually. Sir, uh, when you, uh, we talk about the linkages among the scientific sector, uh, management and conservation sector, and uh, socio-economic sector in developing countries, according to you, what are still lacking that we are failing to protect our biodiversity in reality. Sir, what is your views? 
Please, that's a that's a very big question because that depends on the projects involved and activities involved. But uh, if looking at the broader picture of it, I think what we are lacking is uh, matchmakers. Right, that's what we are lacking. We are lacking people who to connect people because if you look at a lot of the projects in different countries or act activities or even by government agencies, they overlap, they duplicate. And they won't talk to each other. They're all defensive and protective, right? I mean, you can have, you can. Have, I've been to places where you have conservation NGOs working on the same thing, and they, they are back backstabbing each other. But it doesn't make sense because they're trying to do conservation. Of course, they're fighting for the funds. So here, the what I think is the biggest uh, missing link is the matchmaker, and match, matchmaker may not be a person who knows how to connect, but it's a person who can bring these people together. Hey, we need to sit down. Get rid of your differences, right? And you may even bring in a facilitator. The facilitator will be the next matchmaker because a facilitator can't go in and start connecting people. But, but we're talking about maybe at the authority level, maybe the governor say, okay, we have these different agencies, uh, whether it's government or non-governmental, and we are wasting our resources. We are trying to achieve the same thing, but at the same time, we are conflicting and we are wasting our effort for, because we are duplicating rather than replicating. So we need to get together. And if they can't talk to, um, to them among themselves, that's when you bring in a facilitator. So as an outsider where all parties can trust, willing to trust, because this has happened in many places I work where they have to bring in an outsider who's willing to talk and listen. And then... At the end of the day, they, of course, not one day, but at the end of the day, they found some common goals and then realized that, hey, okay, why don't you handle this component? We'll handle this component. Okay, you handle that component and we'll backstop you with some funds or we'll back, backstop you with the technical uh, advice or we'll backstop you with the equipment. So we are talking about complementarity. So I think that's the biggest missing link. Okay. At the other yeah. level, then you have to look at what projects do we have. And just like we talk about waste management, chain of custody, where what are we missing? Which level? So that you need a group of think tank tank to sit down and have chai. People people from different fields, mind you. Now we'll now we'll get all the same people, I mean the same people from the same background, because then they'll have the same mindset. But if you get okay, an anthropologist, a social worker. Uh, a humanitarian, an activist, maybe, uh, and then a scientist, uh, environmental scientist, a biodiversity scientist, bring them together. Then they will have different ideas and give everyone a chance to talk, not talk at the same time, because that's one of the problems I've seen at many of these uh, workshops. Does that help you in brief? I hope. Yes, yes, sir. I got yeah. my point. And I, we, I, mean, I think that uh, we need to address all these parameters. Okay, exactly. sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thomas. Very nice response. Yeah, very nice. The morning shows the day. Beginning is the wonderful beginning with the wonderful speech, Professor. Yes. Thank so, you. yeah, yes, yeah, this spirit they will maintain. Is there, yeah. is there a, any participants uh, wish to ask any question to sir? No, many actually okay. appreciation notes are there. Many of them yes, they are writing and sending messages to me. That wonderful speech, wonderful deliberation, and as uh, okay, someone uh, got interested in the presentation, and he will send to me. I will send to him. So like that, and we have participants across the globe. And I am again, once again, I am requesting all of you uh, to continue with our effort and to be with us. And Professor will be sharing session right from 12 again. At this moment, I think organizing committee will go further with the agenda. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, just a request when I share the PDF to anyone, second, third party, uh, please don't do not upload it to a, a, pri a, a open domain, oh, public right. domain. I mean, you can keep it, you can share with your friend, but it shouldn't be on a public domain, right? This is to anyone who wants it. I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love sharing because yeah. we all we all want to achieve the same thing. And to the students, I love talking to students. Uh, if you have any question, don't be afraid. I will yeah, not yeah, bite yeah. you. It's yeah. Thailand is far away from you, yeah. so I cannot bite you. <laughs>
I'm a toothless dinosaur, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. With this, uh, I hope uh, that we'll be meeting you once later in the conference. And moving to the next agenda. Now, may I request Professor Krishna Roy Pradhani from Department of Botany, SM Professor, to deliver the vote of thanks. Krishna Roy Pradhani. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Namaskar Janaisu Hokoloke. Uh, good morning to everyone. Honorable Chief, Honorable Chief Guest, Professor Ramesh Jimbo Bunratana, Mahidal University of International College, Bangkok, respected Dr. M. S. Lakshmi Priya, Deputy Commissioner, Bongai Gao, uh, respected Professor Jogan Chandra Kalika Sir, uh, Head of the Department, Geology Gohat University, respected uh, Dr. Shadananda Nath Sir, Principal of Abhapri College, and our most uh, valued invited guest dear participants and my dear colleagues. It's my privilege to have, have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. Myself, Krishna Pradhani, uh, on behalf of Abhayapri College, take this opportunity to, take, uh, to propose vote of thanks to those who have directly and indirectly contributed to this event. I extend my, grati uh, my gratitude to our honorable chief guest and resource person, Professor Ramesh Jimbo Bunratana, to take out time from his busy schedule to grace the event. We are really enlightened with your knowledge and presence. Thank you, sir. I also extend my thanks to Dr. M. S. Lakshmi Priya, Deputy Commissioner Bangai Gao, for her gracious presence in this event. Thank you, ma'am, for encouraging us with your valuable words. Thank you. We are extremely thankful to Professor Jagan Chandra Kalita, sir, out of the department, Geology, Kohat University, and also chief advisor of this conference uh, for his enthusiastic support and constant guidance. Thank you so much, sir. I extend my thanks to Dr. Shadananda Nath, sir, principal of Abhapri College, for providing immense support to make the event successful. A special thanks to the organizing committee to organize a seminar even amidst the pandemic. Last but not the least, I thank all the participants, my colleagues, my dear students, for uh, your active cooperation in making the event a resounding success. With these warm words and kind messages, we move to the end of the today's <coughs> inauguration session. Once again, thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you very much. And I do, on behalf of Abhayapuri College, express my thanks that the college gave us the opportunity to meet Ramesh Ratnasar, who is far away from us, but still we are meeting him. Of course, Dr. Jagan Kandasar, I will not speak much of him because he is quite a part of our college. He is always supporting us, helping us, and of course, suggesting us. And the moment he has suggested to prepare the vision document. Thank you very much, all the participants. And thank you very much, sir, for your inaugural speech and sir, for your keynote address. Principal, sir, for organizing everything, giving us the support so that this conference can be organized. I, on behalf of every college, would like to extend my thanks. And now would like to inform you that the next session would be from 12.30. And from the same link, the participants can join for the next session. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Namaskar, sir. Uh, namaskar, namaskar. <laughs> so nice. Yeah, really wonderful beginning by your deputy commissioner, by our keynote speaker, by you yourself and Pori and Rajesh. Rajesh is so smart, no? really. <laughs> Very nice. And, uh, and the student, you know, one student also performed, was uh, singing in the yes. beginning. Yes. Yeah, we must thank her also. Because yes. they, oh, they, they are our future. And yes. the keynote speaker, no? the Pradhani, she was doing very good, speaking so nicely. And our all, Thank those you, who sir. are involved from organizing committee, <clears throat> they are all doing so well. And because in the beginning, no, it, as it is a big event, because international event, and also you are connecting to the entire world from different universities, 
east to the west so it it cannot be easy but i know about your tense on the meticulous work a uh, hard working and planning but when we have professor like ramesh gunaratna we get courage because i i get courage from him because when i as the dr rajesh you know when i discuss with him that we have this proposal so how to formulate the actual title then as i said overnight he worked so hard and finally it was finalized i must admit and <laughs> acknowledge this in here so sir, being sir, the, sir, yeah. let me share let me share one experience sir yeah you are telling sir gunath sir finalized it immediately and what pariman informed me that you were so prompt because uh, gunath sir was so prompt yeah. that immediately you sent back the message whereas pariman did not see the message <laughs> when she saw the message she was little late and she was so surprised that how these people are so active and so prompt yeah. <laughs> that immediately the message was replied sir. so it yeah. is something that we get yeah, 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 like yeah. yeah. thank you very much well, actually i look forward to bring him to assam <laughs> i talked to talk to cotton university professor rezina is here i talked to our hilosity singha who is from borland university your principal i met him one day i was talking about professor bunarasana oh, because okay. if he can come uh, for few days like dr oxoy hello is from uh, bhatradev university and many people from other universities we are joining together so if professor can come to assam he can do wonderful here practical field work the skills he talk about tools and physically he will be with the student and he will be teaching our student on the spot so i look forward for that particular day as our principal is very dynamic and supported by very dynamic deputy commissioner it will be possible because that deputy commissioner as he is so dynamic i think that she will be able to make it possible and we from guwahati university we are also having lots of connections uh, to support you all so therefore i think professor should be free and that is the main thing otherwise we are ready here our stage is ready professor you need to come and you will have to act as the actor and as the india gave you something because you got your degree from punjab so therefore i think you in return you are giving us without knowing you are giving us so much right from the day i met you at guwahati university he met few students maybe at on that day 35 to 40 pg students and they got so encouraged and many of them they wanted to know about him when professor will be coming like that so you are a wonderful person and i think that your association with abhayapuri college abhayapuri you see a a is on the always in the beginning abhayapuri will come always on the top thank you namaskar so we'll meet again at uh, what time uh, dr rajesh tiwari sir 12:30 sir 12:30 okay thank you so much yeah Thank, thank, you. thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. I'll see everyone later. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.